Recognized, Emily of Arden, D, 1, 2. Recognized, Joe Moniak, D, 0, 5. Hello, team. Thanks for joining us for the latest installment of Elseworlds, a series brought to you by our backers on Patreon. In Elseworlds, we will be doing deep dives into the extensive catalog of DC animated movies. My name is Emily, and today I'm joined by producer Neil. And in this series, we'll be discussing the comic history that inspired the movies, how the stories have been changed or updated, and in some cases, how they have inspired or will inspire storylines in Young Justice. Unlike our regular review episodes, we won't be having a Crashing in the Mode segment, so consider this your spoiler warning. There. It's all healed. Wow. What is this thing? The Purple Healing Ray. Yeah, but what is it called? The Purple Healing Ray. Oh, really? Okay. And with that housekeeping out of the way, let's hand it off to Emily for... Hello, Megan! Uh, The title of our movie for this episode is Wonder Woman Bloodlines. It was originally released on October 5th, 2019. The directors were Sam Liu and Justin Copeland. The voice director was Wes Gleason. And the screenplay was by Marguerite Scott, is how I'm going to say that name. I like it. And the voice cast, while it is an entire movie, is not extensive. But it is Rosario Dawson, um, who's in every version of your nerd fandom. Whatever you like, Rosario is there. Um, It's it's true. She's kind of incredible. Uh, So she is playing, of course, Wonder Woman. We have Jeffrey Donovan, which I've seen way too much of because my wife started watching Burn Notice. um, And he is playing Steve Trevor. We also have Marie Avergopoulos playing Vanessa Capitellis, a.k.a. Silver Swan. We have... Adrian C. Moore playing Etta Candy, favorite character. We have Kimberly Brooks playing Cheetah and Giganta. Uh, Courtney Taylor as Dr. Poison. Constance Zimmer as Veronica Kale. Nia Vardalis as Julia Capitellis. Michael Dorn as Ferdinand the Minotaur. Cree Summer as Hippolyta and Medusa. Mozan Marmot as Dr. Cyber. And Ray Chase as none other than Lead Bandit. Just in time for your next mission. Our movie begins with pilot Steve Trevor crash landing in the ocean just off the shore of Themyscira after strange flying robot alien demon things attack his plane. Uh, He is rescued from drowning by Diana, but on the Amazonian island, he is sentenced to prison for trespassing. Diana decides to free Steve and help him escape, defying her mother, Queen Hippolyta's direct orders and choosing to instead travel with Steve back to the United States to help protect and save man's world, as was foretold in the kind of vague prophecies that are referenced. (laughs) It's pretty standard Wonder Woman backstory stuff. Now in Washington, D.C., Steve sets Diana up to stay with archaeologist Dr. Julia Capitalis and her daughter, Vanessa. While Dr. Capitalis is overjoyed to welcome Diana into their home, Vanessa is a bit more uncertain, and over time, through a montage, Vanessa and her mother's relationship becomes increasingly more strained as Dr. Capitalis devotes more and more of her time to helping Diana rather than paying attention to her daughter. And some unspecified amount of time later, Diana decides to become a superhero and adopts the name Wonder Woman. Five years later, Diana stops a bank robbery before meeting up with Steve Trevor and Dr. Capitellus at the Hall of Justice. Julia explains that her daughter Vanessa is planning to illegally sell an ancient artifact stolen from Kale Pharmaceuticals to an unknown buyer. Diana agrees to help, hoping to break up the deal without getting Vanessa arrested. At an at sorry, I know it's an abandoned warehouse. It's just that, of course, it is. Um, and that made Have me you met a comic book that didn't no, I know. set That's... something in an abandoned warehouse? Yeah. What are all They're these everywhere houses? in the comic book version of yes. these places. At an abandoned warehouse, Vanessa meets up with Dr. Poison, but Diana's arrival results in a firefight. And while Diana is able to take down their attackers, Dr. Poison escapes with the artifact and Dr. Capitellus dies as a result of a gunshot wound. Vanessa blames Diana for her mother's death and runs off into the night, even refusing to attend the funeral. And while Diana mourns, blaming herself for what happened to Julia, Vanessa agrees to undergo an experimental treatment from Dr. Poison and Dr. Cyber. Soon after, Etta Candy discovers that Vanessa has been found smuggling tech, medical equipment, and artifacts along the Karak border for Poison and Cyber. So Steve and Diana fly out to investigate. 
in Karak, the two fight their way through a secret facility, eventually coming face to face with Vanessa, who is now a mostly mechanical cyborg with giant wings, calling herself Silver Swan. Dr. Poison escapes the facility with her latest prototype, while Wonder Woman and Steve face off against Silver Swan, eventually incapacitating her. The two decide to bring Vanessa to Veronica Kale, who reveals that Vanessa's robotic modifications are actually the result of a techno-organic virus, turning her into Silver Swan from the inside out, a process that will eventually take over her entire body and kill her. Diana realizes that the only place that may be able to help Vanessa is on Themyscira. The only problem is that Diana's memory of Themyscira's location was taken from her when she left the island. Veronica suggests searching Julia Capitalis's old office for useful information, and there, Diana, Steve, and Etta eventually find a book about the Temple of Pasiphae, a goddess who helped people see the future. And Diana believes visiting the shrine may lead the way to Themyscira. So it's time for another field trip. Uh, And when the trio arrives on the island, Diana is waylaid by a fight with Cheetah, who's now working with Poison and Cyber, while the others head into the shrine's maze, only to discover that it is protected by a minotaur. After beating Cheetah, Diana enters the shrine and has a fragmented vision of Themyscira. The trio then returns to Kale Pharmaceuticals, where Veronica helps Diana piece together the elements of her vision to discover the location of Themyscira. However, this information is also intercepted by Dr. Cyber, who hacks the building's private server, activates a self-destruct protocol for the floor they are all currently on, and, of course, wakes up Silver Swan, who immediately attacks Diana. A battle ensues as everyone attempts to flee the building, And while Diana is unable to reason with Vanessa, she is eventually able to help get the rest of the group to safety while Vanessa escapes. Knowing that Poison and Cyber are headed to Themyscira, Wonder Woman and company suit up to face off against them. On the way there, Diana confides in Steve about her reservations about returning home after disobeying her mother and betraying her people. But before anybody can dwell on that too much, Vanessa attacks their plane while she <laughs> while she and Wonder Woman face off in the air on the island. Poison and Cyber successfully break down the city gate and release their prototype, a resurrected and mechanically enhanced Medusa who immediately turns over a dozen Amazons to sow. But she refuses to follow the orders of Poison and Cyber, instead choosing to kill them both and using her enlarging serum on herself and attempt to destroy all of the Amazons. After trying yet again to reason with Vanessa, both she and Diana crash land in the middle of the battle on Themyscira. Hippolyta and the other remaining Amazons barricade themselves within the palace while Diana faces off against Medusa. Steve is turned to stone, Diana and Vanessa are both bitten by Medusa's snakes, and everything seems to be going very poorly until Diana thwarts Medusa's powers by blinding herself with the venom of one of her own snakes. Unable to see Medusa, Diana is able to fight her without fear of being turned to stone. And just when all seems lost, Vanessa rejoins the fight, protecting Diana and eventually flying her up to cut off the monster's head. With Medusa slain, all those who were turned to stone are transformed back, including Steve. And everyone gets the medical help that they require, including Vanessa, who was cured of her silver swan virus. We end on a celebration where Diana is embraced by her mother and welcomed home by the Amazons as Wonder Woman, champion of Themyscira. And just when everything seems wrapped up, nice and neat, we get an after credit scene where Diana confronts Veronica Kale, who reveals that she'd been working with Dr. Poison and Dr. Cyber to steal the Amazons' advanced technology, and and that she even murdered Dr. Capitalis to keep her from learning the truth. Diana not so subtly threatens to destroy Veronica Kale if she ever goes after Themyscira again, and the film ends on Dr. Kale swearing revenge against Wonder Woman. And with that... It's, t- it's time for Aster. Superboy, are you all right? I'm fine. Feeling the Aster. So I have various opinions and thoughts on this film that are all over the place. And so I'm going to be jumping around a bit. But I want to start off with uh, Rosario Dawson is a lovely Wonder Woman. Oh, yeah. Uh, she has the like perfect put together commanding voice for this character at, in like this context of this film that I'm like, this is fabulous. And I don't, I think I got through a lot of the movie before I realized it was Rosario Dawson. And then the second I realized, I was like, of course it's Rosario Dawson. How could I ever have thought anything else? Mm-hmm. But 
she's very good. She's got it. She's got like that kind of distinct voice that works really well for Wonder Woman of making her sound like I don't know what the word I'm looking for is, but kind of like that commanding royal tone in her voice that makes her sound like she's not of this world and also very put together and ready to command an army. And I like it. Well, yeah, and I think that was the the thing that really, I mean, so she's used as the voice actor for Wonder Woman through all of this, like, story arc, this timeline, okay. through, like the Got DC it. animated universe. There's so many people that could have difficulty delivering the line man's world and it not sounding <laughs> so ridiculous because it's a very, I mean, but it, but it's foreign. It's a foreign concept and constantly referring to it as man's world didn't come across as weird. So I mean, just saying, saying that speaks so much to her voice acting in this. I do think that is, I think that is a very overlooked talent of people who work in genre fiction of like finding actors who can say things that could sound absolutely ridiculous, but say them in a way that sounds fully sincere and normal is a talent. Uh, and I think it is amazing. Yeah. Man's world. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That is a thing. So some less positive things for this one, this movie, I, I don't know what it was. This movie was a bit, I guess confusing and a bit all over the place. It felt a little bit like even the first time through the like five years earlier and then having the thing be present day felt kind of awkward because it's like when you do uh, like a cold open like that, generally with movies, it's pretty short. Like it's like one scene or like just a couple scenes to establish something and then you cut forward. And this movie, like it's a good like, 20 uh-huh. minutes of the movie before we cut to quote unquote present day and I kept being like when are we what what's the plot of this movie going to be kind of thing it just felt kind of weird like it sets up so much as like this is going to be a Wonder Woman origin story and then we cut 5 years in the future and I think part of it was like the weird way that it was referred to as like 5 years earlier and then present day instead of starting the movie and then cutting to 5 years later does that make any sense? Like those are two different concepts in my mind. Okay, so I'm so the, we talked about it a little bit before, and when we originally came up with the idea of like the Else Worlds, I went on this like epic journey to just like kind of watch every single thing that kind of felt it fell into the category we were looking at. And when you talk about the DC animated universe, it's a 16 movie run that ended with Apocalypse War which is the movie just after this one. So this oh. so this movie falls as 15 of 16 in this entire giant run of movies of which Wonder Woman was in the very first movie. So it was very confusing and I think the way you described it would have really changed the context especially for people that have watched again 14 movies in this storyline where it should have probably started in the present day. And looked back to the past yeah. because it was a completely super established character in this run. Rosario Dawson has been Wonder Woman for seven movies before this in this ah, run. Yeah. So I think like, yeah, present day. And I think of like when she would like pick up an ancient artifact and then you have that like flashback to look at everything would have probably been. Like kind of. Like, not to compare this to live action DC, but kind of the way that the live action Wonder Woman movie starts, where it starts with her as we have seen her in a couple movies up to that point, and then we flash back and get her origin story. I see what you mean. Because this does... Yeah, because so many movies before this. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Because it does, that does feel kind of weird. Like, I get why, if that is the larger context, because I have not seen the entire DC animated canon. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, we get different perspectives. I can understand why they would feel the need to do the five years earlier and present day thing in that context to make sure that the timeline is clear within the context of the mm-hmm. larger several movies. But when you do what I did and you watch this movie with no context, which feels like something you sh- can be able to do because it's not marked as something that is part of a saga kind of thing. It feels a little more awkward. Yeah, because everything but, that those first 20 minutes would have happened in like completely happened before you see her introduced in the first movie she shows up. In. OK, um, OK. 
which it's so weird to get an origin story so far in advance. I, I, it makes me think of Black Widow, a wonderful movie, but like it feels like a movie that should have come out several years ago. It should have, but we're yeah. not going to get into that. No, no. I but just, also, at least with that, they avoided the thing that would have, and this is now me turning this into a different conversation, but I think part of how Black Widow works is that Black Widow doesn't try to do an origin yeah. story in a lot of ways. It does flashbacks to origin story moments that we've had context for and just kind of shows them to you for the first time. Whereas this starts off for 20 minutes being an origin story before becoming a different movie. And part of the thing for me watching this movie, there is the montage of Diana, like before she becomes a superhero and her and Dr. Capitalis and all of that. And I, on the second time through, started thinking about it too hard the way that I do with movies sometimes and realized I was like, I'm not sure how much time is supposed to be passing here. I'm like, is this months? Is this years? I'm not sure. And because, and it's a thing that you run into with animation of like, I'm never going to tell animators, hey, you have to create multiple different distinct uh, mm-hmm. aged by a year models of a character for one sequence because that is so much work for such a short amount of time in a movie. But it's like, I don't know how much time that was supposed to be looking back on it. Um, I And to me, it's a very different feeling of that if Wonder Woman is there for like, six months or if she's there for like two years like those are a different amount of emotional weight to that montage and i'm not sure which one it's supposed to be yeah do you have one haircut is like your your like one haircut in a wardrobe change is like your only clue that time has passed but yeah but then we subsequently get a five-year jump after that as well yes which i think is part of the confusion for me it's like we've done you did a passage of time and then a time skip, and I'm really not sure how much time was between leaving Themyscira and then getting to the time jump, and I kind of want to know. I need to figure <laughs> this thing. And speaking of that montage, as I do a couple more, this is me trying to be like negative, but not that negative. I'm trying to give some constructive criticism here. I personally do not love the shorthand of teen embraces goth styling as a visual shorthand for teen is going down a dark and dangerous criminal path Mm. because like i know or know of way too many like goths and punks who became happier healthier more stable people when they embraced the style and culture that worked for them so like it feels like a very kind of very 2000s idea of like if a girl cuts her hair and starts wearing dark eyeliner clearly something is wrong and i'm like or maybe she's just having a good time guys yeah and like i think of like my high school days and like early college it's just like a lot of the clothing that i liked happened to be black yes i had substantial spikes through most of high school and i still to this day have pierced ears um okay And I'm probably one of the happier people that most people meet. So I don't know. And it's just like it was one of those things where I, as I said, I went into this movie with very little context. And I I don't think I realized until like halfway through the movie when I paused it or something and the like everything popped and the title popped up. I don't think I realized that this movie was necessarily from 2019 because Mm. that particular trope is such an early 2000s kind of trope that it like took me a minute. I was like. Oh, this must have been like earlier in the in the DC animated movie canon. It's like, nope. I'm like, oh, okay. And it's not, it's not like the worst thing in the world. It's just one of those things that makes me go, was there nothing more we could do? Was there no other way that we could present this kind of thing? <laughs> PSA to the whole world. If a girl shaves half her head, it doesn't mean she's a criminal. It just means that's how she wants to wear her hair. Mm-hmm. Uh, leave her be. So a few other things. Speaking of also this being the kind of uh, catalyst for the whole film, it kind of feels like the driving central Silver Swan Wonder Woman conflict is women being jealous and catty towards each other, which is never really my fave for women-led drama. Like, there's literally quotes where Diana says, why did you let them do this to you? And 
Silver Swan responds with, you were always perfect while well, I'm perfect now. And I'm like, I don't love it because like. I get that I get that by the end of the movie it's about Wonder Woman being this em- empathetic compassionate person who is willing to heal and forgive anyone in need of help and I get that it is trying to set up this kind of parallelism between Diana and Vanessa both having struggles with their mothers and I get that and those things I like but the idea that Silver Swan's driving force for becoming a villain is I need to get back at Wonder Woman because she stole my mom feels not great. It feels a little awkward and just. Yeah, I'm going to do bad. I'm going to do bad things to get attention. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. And it's like one of those. Again, it feels very kind of. 90s early 2000s kind of way of like approaching a storyline like this when I'm like I wish I wish there was more nuance and I wish there was a way that that particular element of it could have been avoided because those other parts of Diana being that empathetic force in this young woman's life and going I will not abandon you and there is always hope I'm like that's great Wonder Woman stuff right there I just wish that Silver Swan's motivation was not seemingly entirely i am jealous of you perfect wonder woman because it's iffy to say the least (laughs) yeah and diana's attachment also makes me think that that time jump or like that montage time was probably more than months it probably leans towards years and there is just like a little bit of an issue with wonder woman's back catalog of adversaries and just that they historically just make them all women which is Like, until reading the note, it just really hit me. I'm like, is there a single person that she goes up against that has a line? I mean, I guess Lee Bandit is the best we have. It's not like every single person that she goes against is a femme-presenting character. But almost all of them are. Yeah. Which I get. It's a thing. It's a thing in Wonder Woman storytelling to give her female adversaries and it goes back to like very old tropes in comics of like early wonder woman of all of her villains that are like classic wonder woman villains that have persisted are generally women because she was a female superhero so they had to have her fight women and someone else can unpack that whole history i'm sure it's in a documentary somewhere oh yeah but and like i don't necessarily hate that because it does lead to like interesting conflicts of allowing women superheroes to fight other women and to avoid like certain imagery of that isn't always fun of like male villains just beating up on Wonder Woman, which can't isn't always a fun thing to watch. Like yep. it allows you to avoid certain bad tropes, but then also leads <laughs> sometimes to other different bad <laughs> tropes. Yep. Like where you're like, well, why can't Wonder Woman fight fight a guy? If Batman can fight poison ivy or Catwoman. why can't wonder woman fight a guy it's it's complicated double standards are strange uh and yeah. finding a way to walk every line can be difficult so i don't necessarily hate uh i don't i don't hate that most of the driving characters in this movie are women other than steve trevor <laughs> yep speaking of that very quick side note that I'm just going to call out and then move past. Uh, why does resurrected robot Medusa have built-in heels? She doesn't need those. No. It wasn't necessary. I only Not noticed because she becomes giant and we have several shots of giant Medusa feet crushing various Amazons. And my brain registered those are built-in high heels yeah. on a resurrected mythical creature who is also kind of a robot. Heavy yeah. sigh, moving on. And last, maybe last, uh, <laughs> I'm not going to say last because okay. it really won't be another one more note. I like, I don't love being this negative about this movie and I will have some positive things to say later and we'll get into some of Neil's notes and we'll have some fun conversation, but I'm laying out some of my problems with this movie to, I don't know, hopefully highlight the things that it does do well as well. In this movie, there is a romance between Diana and Steve, and perhaps you having more of a uh, context of the entire rest of the series can maybe shed some light on this. But I feel like this romance kind of falls flat. And like me as someone who is 
it, who does, I don't know, who reads things from a female perspective and understands some concepts of trying to present feminist ideology in genre media. Sometimes I get that. Uh, feels like this movie kind of fell into the relatively common trap of trying to like make a story quote unquote more feminist or like more girl power by downplaying the romance element. But instead, it just kind of leads to having a weak romance between these two iconic characters who I who, from what I know of comics, have kind of like an iconic romance. And the movie just almost feels like it hopes you'll just go, that's an iconic romance from the comic and we don't have to develop it too much, which I don't love because it could be really sweet and it could be really great in this movie. And it just feels like. It's brushed over and brushed over and brushed over, and then they kiss, and then we brush over it some more. <laughs> yeah, I don't have any good news for you. Oh uh, no, I don't. I don't think he's comes up as Steve Trevor at any other point until this movie. I'm literally double checking it because I really don't. I was that. hoping. No, I was so hoping. I was so hoping that when you said, "Oh, there's more movies," I'm like, "Well, maybe, maybe I'm just missing something." I don't think you are. Answer. You are not. Oh, no. So, yeah. It's just one of those things where, like, I get the impulse in superhero fiction or any. It happens a lot in action fiction that stars women of, like, men in action movies can have a love interest and that somehow doesn't take away from the plot. But there is this kind of misconception that if you give a woman, a love interest in an action movie, somehow she is suddenly less feminist, which isn't true at all and doesn't need to be true. And it's its own version of a harmful, silly trope if we perpetuate it. And so, like, I like that Steve's in this movie. I like that he and, and Diana respect each other and have kind of just a cute little thing going. But it also feels like it's brushed over for a lot of the movie in ways that it doesn't need to be. And in ways that it doesn't necessarily, that don't necessarily work for, I feel like what it's trying to do. Like, like there is, there is a moment that I put in my notes and that Neil is highlighting in our outline as I speak. Yes. Uh, where when they're flying to Karak to go do something, they have this whole exchange where, He's where Steve's talking about, oh, I love I love flying. And Diana responds with, well, you never flew with me. And he says, well, yeah, well, you were flying with Superman and three's a crowd. And she says, I'm not flying with Superman now. And they both smile. And I watching this and especially on my second rewatch was like, OK, sure, that's a that's a cute little exchange. But what am I actually supposed to learn about these characters and their relationship from this exchange? Like, was Diana dating Superman at one point? Is that the metaphor we're going with here? Or have Steve and Diana always just been kind of flirty and not actually gotten together? Or are we saying that they are an item, but they never get any time to hang out together because superheroing? I I could not tell you what their relationship is supposed to be in the five years later portion if you paid me. And it's so frustrating. Yeah, so there's there's a lot there that's not used because the idea is like, you know, even in that short montage, Steve is the person that helps her figure out who she wants to be. Because like when she first starts out, it's like, how can she help the world? Like that's man's world. You know, how, that's her task in, in her heart of hearts. And Steve's clearly the one that helps her find out that Wonder Woman and being Wonder Woman is what – she ultimately wants like that's the at the path that she wants to walk, whereas she's doing all this archaeology and these other things and, you know, looking to history to try and better the world. But like, yeah, OK, cool. You you help me literally find out what I want to do with the rest of my life. Uh, OK, bye. And then also like she has the what well, I don't uh, she she's afforded time where Steve is not. So also, Steve, you literally just didn't do anything for five years. I, she come on, Steve, get it together. Yeah, it's the thing of the 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 prologue, the cold open of this movie, whatever it may be, like very clearly sets up like these two people are immediately interested and attracted to each other and they are now spending more time together. They are working together. All of these things like they are flirting from the minute that he wakes up and is like, you're an angel. I'm not dead. This is cool. Uh, You're beautiful. Thank you for saving me. And I'm like, 
and then you spent five years and never and this never came up is that what we're suggesting because that feels like what we're suggesting by the end of this when edit when edit candy is like maybe she wouldn't go back to them as if she had something to stay for and i'm like are you not already an item like i think i went through most of this movie assuming you were an item i'm confused and i get that it's an hour and t- like 15 minute movie i get that like there is only a limited amount of time and we are trying to tell a story and there is a larger world outside. And I'm not saying that this movie needs to focus on a Steve and Diana romance. And I get that that's not what this movie is focused on, but it's one of those things where if you're going to include a story element like this, like a romantic subplot, like you have to develop it to the point of it being a story that works and is clearly communicated rather than just kind of sprinkle in some moments that feel weird and disjointed because I don't know how I'm supposed to interpret a moment watching some of the scenes in this where I'm like I'm like as I said I'm like I did not realize you two weren't an item my first time through kind of thing I was like I just assumed that we were cutting five years later and you guys were dating no uh and if that's not what I was supposed to assume you need to make that more clear to me yeah it's a thing Like, it's the same thing of there were several moments in this that I, the first time watching, didn't realize, like, even outside of the romantic subplot, I wasn't quite sure what, I I didn't realize I had missed something until it came up later. Like, I did not realize the first time through that Steve didn't witness the fight between Diana and Hippolyta on the island because they like glare at each other and Diana like tells him to step aside basically. And he walks off screen. And I assumed for whatever reason that like he was just off screen. Like that he, he was able to aside. both see and hear like a normal human being. Yeah, that the, like the sound I, of battle would have instructed him to turn around. Like I had assumed that the first time through watching that that was a moment of Diana being like, step aside, this is something I need to handle on my own kind of thing. Cause that's like what the body language of that scene read to me. And that they then had that fight and then Diana making her point and making her stand and Hippolyta walking away that Diana would have presumably also stepped off screen, rejoined Steve Trevor and they sail off on a boat to lands unknown. But then you get to like the, an hour in and Steve is like, I never knew that you did all of it. I thought your mom just let you leave. I didn't. I was like, Oh, I have been operating under a completely different reality than this movie meant for me to. Oh no. Kind of thing. I was like, I didn't know that this wasn't a known fact among this group. Well, also that like, cause my interpretation was also like, go get the boat ready. But again, like the, still within ear or visual range like i can see the water like i mean but then also the, that also means that it at no point in the seven plus who knows how long or well five plus, in five I, to I, I, eight years uh, that yes. this never came up never nah. never came up and we didn't we're not gonna talk about it yeah yeah it's just one of those things it's again it's one of those things where i feel i almost feel like this this movie needed like like one more draft because there are moments and things in this movie that are really strong and really interesting and like some oh, yeah. really cool themes that of Wonder Woman that are like classic core Wonder Woman themes. And then there's just some of the pieces needed to be moved around a bit more. And like, because it didn't all fit together quite right. Like, I feel like this needed like one more draft and it would have been a really, really solid movie because it's not a bad movie. It's just a movie where things kept confusing me, <laughs> which I kind of feel bad saying because like it's not it's not a horrible movie. It's just a movie where certain things don't click. So a few things that I do like before we move on to some of Neil's notes is uh, I like Diana's armor design in this movie that we see her in the beginning and near the end. I have a couple qualms about her superhero look for the majority of the rest of the movie, because if you're going to put Diana in the swimsuit costume, can we not have it so high cut uh, on the legs that it just, you know, it's it's not the best look. 
I do like the armor, though. I like the armor. It looks very cool. It looks very Amazon. It looks very kind of the classic Wonder Woman with like the cool Mm -hmm. Grecian armor skirt and give her her cool sword and all of it together. I'm like, this is great. I love it. And and I kind of wish it was just her costume for the whole movie. Uh, Well, I don't know why it's not. What? I have bad news. That's her costume for all the other movies. I know that that's why it's not her costume for the whole movie. I understand that most of these movies were made in an era where this was kind of the general one Roman look in the comics. But I'm over here being like, I like that armored skirt. That armored skirt looks cool. Uh, (laughs) It's like, I know why it's not her whole look for the movie, but I wish it was. But my main thing that I do really like in this movie that I kind of really picked up on in my second watch through was that I love that the way that they have written Wonder Woman for this movie, she is constantly trying to reason with every enemy she faces before a fight breaks out. It's She never throws the first punch in any kind of battle, except, except for when she breaks Steve out of jail and just punches someone in the face because it's the only way that she can get this to work. But other than that, they set up the thing that's kind of I remember there was there was a famous panel from Wonder Woman comics that was going around online a couple months back and I can't remember all of it now but it's Wonder Woman saying something where she's like never kill an enemy that you can that you can fight instead never fight an enemy that you can subdue never subdue an enemy that you can talk to at like going down this whole list of like what her code is in any kind of situation that ends with like and never raise a hand to someone before extending it first and it's this whole thing that i've like speaks very clearly i think to how wonder woman works as a character that she is kind of this like i want to save and protect the world i am trained to fight but i do not fight as my first response kind of thing and i think it's done in a really interesting and good way in this movie that wonder woman does never falters in her belief that she can save vanessa like she is at every interaction with vanessa going hi i care about you let me help you and i will offer this to you every time i see you until you say yes there is no ultimatum there is no this offer will not run out this is not it does not hinge on your behavior i will offer to help you every time I see you until you figure out that you are deserving of help. And that is a really strong statement and strong sentiment for this character that I do like in the middle of this movie that I clearly have some other strange and confusing problems with. I really like that idea behind this character and the way that she's presented here. It's good. It's interesting because, I mean, some of my notes are that, like, I really like the third act. Which is so interesting because a lot of the the issues that we have with the story up until that third act, but the fact that like they managed to like literally land that plane in the end, or because like you've had Mechano Medusa storm through all of the mascara and she's like, Hold on, I'm gonna cover my eyes, but maybe like we could be good. Uh no, you're gonna try and rip my mom's limbs off. Okay, never mind. Um, but I tried. So like even in that moment of just like you're at the gates, the final gates, but you're still willing to extend that hand. Yeah, it's good. It's a good moment, especially because her thing, what the thing that she says is, I don't know what lies they told you, but you Mm. don't have to do this. We don't have to be enemies because Diana wants to believe that like, hey, there is no reason for us to fight here. And once Medusa makes it clear of like, no, I'm not operating (laughs) under anybody's jurisdiction. I just hate all of you. Kind of that yeah. idea that she lays out. Then is like, oh, okay, yeah, no, I, I don't, I'm not gonna do, I don't, no, no, that's okay. not okay. Slash attack, uh, and even like the fact that Wonder Woman gets and like the parts of that fight that are really interesting of like the moment Hippolyta realizes and says, someone's like, I don't think Diana's gonna survive this, and Hippolyta says she's not trying to, she's just trying to defeat medusa she's not trying to live she's just trying to win is a really strong and interesting sentiment and like diana's solution to the fight being i will is just being her deciding that she will blind herself with snake of magic snake venom so that she can fight medusa i'm like that's that's pretty cool that's a pretty cool thing to do like even if you like 
I get that everything gets fixed by the magic purple healing ray by the end of this, the very simply named magic purple healing ray, and that it can fix everything. But like part of me watching this is like, do you know how cool it would be if Wonder Woman just like into the future had these like really cool scars and just fought as just amazing Wonder Woman with cool scars and no vision? That would be kind of awesome because it looks really cool. It's a cool design choice. Because sometimes magic evil snake venom splatters across your face in such a way that it gives you like a cool phoenix mask and it looks amazing and epic. But like all of that fight, like some of the things going on in that fight, even though the last, even though like the last 20 minutes of this movie are just one giant fight, there are moments of it being really cool and having these really cool character moments in the midst of it that I just, that I wish were carried through into a lot of the rest of the movie because as you were saying like the th- you said the third act of this movie is really cool and i think almost yeah. the problem is that the this movie kind of feels like three movies all at once if mm. that makes sense like the different yep. acts of th- the three acts of this movie feel like three different movies a little bit like we get a wonder woman origin story at the beginning and then in the middle you have the kind of wonder woman facing off against dr poison and figuring out this whole thing and doing kind of globe trotting fighting these villains and then those villains are just wiped out in the last third and they're not the villains of the movie anymore there is a new villain who feels like a separate like mythological wonder woman larger conflict kind of movie and i'm like i don't and that might be what the problem is this movie is three movies and any of those movies individually might have been really solid but instead we have three jigsaw puzzle pieces from three different movies that are kind of sewn together as best as they can be that might be the actual main problem here because i don't think any of them on their own would have been as confusing as they are when they're all fit together like this yeah i don't know sorry i've been talking for a while neil no, you you're have good. more notes i'm sorry i've I do, I do. just wandered off so so i was thinking about some of like the animation choices like the animation overall like the budget that these movies get is very high and it's very good um one of the choices that i saw on like watching it again is that there's a very intentional choice that when the medusa is involved you know the vision is is very important so like when she's trying to force someone to look at her their eyes change but what i noticed is that when steve gets turned to stone and i'm not sure if it happens with other characters but his eyes turn gray first And then the rest of it, it's just, it's so subtle and it's just really well done. It's like, it's all based on vision. Now, granted, I don't know why nobody else covered their eyes, but that's a whole nother can of worms to be like, hey guys. Or did the thing from Greek mythology that that Perseus did, which is like the mirror shield uh, and that whole thing, which they. So that, that's actually what I thought Diana was going to do was like going to turn the snake back on her. No, that's not how it works. Venom in my eyes was like, Oh wow, that's super hardcore. Cool. I like I like this choice. It's good. It was a good it was a good interesting choice. I was like, "Oh, that's I didn't realize that was where we were going, but that's cool." kind of thing. And like I like that. I like when an action scene especially in like a superhero movie can come up with some weird, interesting, fun genre thing that makes me go, "Oh my god, that's so cool." instead of just kind of being like, "Okay, two people are fighting. I guess this is fun." Like that was a very good moment in the midst of that fight. Yeah. And the, we were in theory led to the idea that the Medusa would be involved, but not in like in really subtle ways that okay, because they mention like when they're digging through the note that the Medusa cells potentially being used for healing when she has the, the, the vision, the rod of, <laughs> uh, we'll try the rod of as Clepius shows up in her visions as well. So that's the medical, like oftentimes the, like the medical symbol that you see in hospitals is the two snakes wrapping with the wings. The other version of that is a single snake wrapped around a rod. And so you see that in her vision as well. And so like, there's all these things that should lead us to the idea of the Medusa, but the character's not involved until the very end, but then becomes the penultimate, like all of the mascara is going to blow up because of this. Yeah. It, yeah, it's really interesting. I, I know we're led there, but like when it happens, it's just so much bigger. That, like, I mean, literally and figuratively than I was expecting. Yeah. It's there are those hints dropped, but they don't necessarily lead me to being like, and the payoff for this will be giant Medusa killing a city. 
and I and subverting expectations can be fun, but then sometimes it's like, well, I want the story to unfold in a way that, like, you know, makes sense. And so it feels it feels a little off when it's like that fight with Medusa, very cool. The fact that Medusa is not like the main villain of the story up until that point, more confusing. Uh, a little bit more confusing. Yeah, the and then the twist on like modernizing and fitting it into like the overall story arc is is good. So I think did it feel weird that there were parademons to start this off for you? It felt weird that they were never addressed again. Correct. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Because again, it's the thing where I was like watching this movie with no. Con- I went into this mm-hmm. movie with no context. I did not know what this movie was supposed to be. I did not read about it before I hit play. So I go into this movie and I'm like oh, I guess we're doing maybe like a Wonder Woman origin story thing or maybe like, oh, it says like five years ago. So I wonder when this is going to maybe like whatever she's facing now kind of like goes dormant for a while and then we'll like come back to it. But no, there's just we make a big deal. There are these demon robot alien things and then Mm -hmm. we don't address them again. And I think I did at some point watch the movie the first time I was like, oh, Oh, we don't, we're never going to know what happened with that. Okay. I guess you solved it. <laughs> yeah. Not in this movie. No, and it makes perfect context for like the storyline as a whole. Got like, it. There's Got a it. lot of parademons involved and like, that's a, like a really big deal. So it makes perfect sense that, um, because you know, in a lot of the stories, the context of the war that is happening and Steve is going after these, uh, whoever he's fighting in said war, um, also, yeah, having a modern plane plane go down is really interesting because, like, they just use different methodology for flight. Um, so, like, that fighter would just sink so fast. Um, whereas, like, the old ones, he could kind of just ride it out. Also, why didn't he pull a parachute? Oh, okay. Um, because no, he think- needs to be saved by Diana. Like, that that I will let slide on some level because I'm like, I get it. No matter what era we're in, you got to crash a plane and get saved by an Amazon. Yep. <laughs> But no, I think like the way it fits into the overall story, and like I said, both a modernization and the story itself is really good, but it lacks the context of the fact that it's fitting into this 15, 16 movie storyline. Yeah. Again, and that's that's at least partially on me. I didn't know that I had to watch 14 movies to watch this movie, though it may also be just a, just a little bit on DC, not necessarily marking these films in a way that makes me understand which ones I have to watch before I can watch one. Oh yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's a little bit on all of us. I'm a huge fan of the, like the super comic book trope of just like, I where, where was that gun of green of the liquid that you, cause some of you could <laughs> maybe have hidden it. One of you could not have under yeah. no circumstances. Yep. You're not she wearing just, anything. Maybe she hid it under some rubble that she was planning on being thrown into so that she could make it dramatic. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah, Agreed. that's like, otherwise, otherwise I'm like, what? You just, you just pulled that out of hammer space or whatever it's called. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It is. A, it is a question. And it's, it's yeah, it's a thing. And then, of course, we have everything that is Etta is the best part of this movie. She is amazing. I do love her. I do love her in this film. She is a very good, fun, supporting character. Yeah. Like, oh yeah, everything about the arc of like, I don't want to be there, but I can fly this plane. I get everything that I, that I said that I wanted. Um, yeah. Best line. Some of the best lines. It's Like I watching this the first time, one of the things that did actually genuinely make me laugh watching this movie was when they fly the jet out of, out of there. And I literally, said out loud i wonder if that can be invisible and then two seconds later it was and then they made a joke Mm -hmm. about like did you steal an invisible jet from the u.s government and she goes what are you talking about steve jets can't be invisible and then immediately hangs up on him too (laughs) and i'm like that's great i love i love her little supporting role in this movie and how she is fun and competent and interesting and she gets everything she sets out for in this quest. Yes. Okay. So I think I do. I think it's a good movie. It has a, a lot of problems. And I think it's where it's placed. It's what they're trying to do. But again, it's so weird to me that the, the final act ends up being the best. 
that just trips me out a little bit because usually it's like most most movies that have problems, usually those problems come in that they can't kind of bring what they've brought to the table together in a way that like feels good. But I really do feel like if I just started that part of the movie, I'd be more confused but happier. Because <laughs> weirdly in this case, it's like you didn't necessarily bring together the first two acts of your film into a reasonable conclusion, but the conclusion you did bring it to is fun yeah uh, and so it just kind of, it's weird it's weird where again as i keep saying i don't think this movie is a bad movie i would not, this is not a movie where i'd go oh don't no don't spend an hour 20 minutes watching this kind of thing i'm like go watch it there are fun yeah. parts of it it's interesting if you really love wonder woman if she is your fave go give it a try see how you feel about this wonder woman maybe Watch the first 14 movies so that certain things make more sense to you in context so that you're not me being confused by (laughs) random things and being like, why wasn't that ever addressed? Oh, it was 12 movies ago. Got it. That's Mm -hmm. on me. But like, it's it's fine. There are just parts of it that are confusing to me and they may only be confusing to me or to us because like we talk about and think about movies and TV shows very regularly and very in depth to the point of like we notice things that some people might not notice like that's Mm -hmm. not if you want a fun movie this could be your fun movie go for it follow your dreams follow your heart yes so with that being our our general take on this movie let's talk about where it came from let's talk about what's some of the comic book history neil see i know stuff only a future boy would know dick grayson tim drake garfield logan your name's tim and yours is Dick? Oops, spoilers. This secret identity thing is so retro. So the fun thing that you asked me was, is this based on anything? And the answer is no. Like this <laughs> this storyline isn't based on anything in that it's based on everything that is Wonder Woman up until this time. My favorite by far is the purple healing ray <laughs> because that's it. We're done. You now have all the comic history this pretty much out there. It's a purple ray that heals and of course has a counterpart that does death. And it is called the purple death ray. That's it. Welcome aboard. You, you now have as much information as is out there. Oh gosh. Like the only variance is like who made it. Sometimes it's like Diana is the one that made it. Sometimes it's other people, a different Greek God, all these things, but like ultimately one heals one does death. It's such a comic book thing to exist. It's just such a, this can solve whatever problem we need. But also, it's hard to get to, so we we can't always use it. But like, if we need it, it's there kind of thing. Yeah. Like, the way that comics sometimes do. It's fun and it's funny. And it's it's very funny that it's just called the Purple Healing Ray. Um, oh, yeah. I, would, I was assuming there would be more, but then, yeah, I, nope. It's it's not. Uh, but there are more with, with the Silver Swan, which, I mean, that is another thing that I, I really thought was an interesting take on it, that it didn't necessarily go the cyborg route, that at the end of the, you know, at the end of the film, she ends up not having any of that anymore, that they really truly went down the road of like Technovirus, which is an interesting take on it because you still had the Sonic Scream, which historically the Silver Swan has had. And Vanessa is the third iteration and the most current, like in Rebirth and New 52. Um, she is Silver Swan. But yeah, it's just interesting that it went that road um, rather than like she was a character that still was the Silver Swan after. Yeah. yeah. Like, I don't. I don't know what Vanessa's future holds at the end of this movie. She's just okay and wearing a pink dress, which I guess is shorthand for she's okay now. But we'll see what she does with her life. We probably won't. I'm assuming she's not in the final the final DC movie, but you know. That's a no. Somebody's fan fiction heart can hope and figure out where her story goes from here. She's okay, and that's all we need to know. Yes, she grows old on Themyscira. Sure. Because she will. (laughs) Uh, Which I'm like, well, uh, I mean, you'll be the only one, I think, growing old there because the rest don't. Um, And then, of course, we we have my second favorite character, Ferdinand the Minotaur. 
there's pretty much everything that I like about this. You have Michael Dorn, who plays Worf on Star Trek. He's voicing Ferdinand. Then you have like this weird, like you brought it up, this weird referential. I mean, because you have the story of Ferdinand the Bull that's been around forever. But then like it kind of came more into the limelight with the WB product and Looney Tunes bringing that back. Um, but his first introduction to DC Comics, I made sure that I went back and read it. They just like go into a kitchen and he is just cooking food. Like the first time that this character appears in <laughs> in comic form for anyone. He's just there cooking food and mind you not okay with being called a minotaur because there is only one minotaur and there is only one kithotar because he is from Kithira, not Minos. So also uh, he he is a vegetarian because he doesn't believe in eating meat because that's not cool with him. So there's your comics history, a tad on the Kithotar, mind you, not you the Minotaur. Go. There you go. He's oh a good gosh. dude. It made me so happy. It was like, and, and it also made me think of like, because you kind of brought it up that like that storyline seems a little odd because my other thought would be like, Hey, we just found and saved this min- giant Minotaur who blasted through countless walls with reckless abandon. Why did we not bring him along? Yeah. I felt, I felt that a little, like it's a really funny joke to have him make everybody dinner and then not participate in the battle. But part of my brain is like, can we acknowledge why we're not taking him along? Is there a reason? Yeah. My thought would be like, I, I mean, I almost lo- love the idea that he would claim pacifism or, and then you, like go that route. And then he was forced into the servitude in the maze and is like, no, thank you. But no, I won't help. Like, that's not my deal. I just I'd just like like one more line to make yes. that clear. <laughs> like, give me give me one more line from Ferdinand. <laughs> no, I am very busy making this salad. I cannot <laughs> assist you. The other thing I will throw out in the history section for this is we, a couple months back in the whelmed book club that we run over on our Discord, read Wonder Woman Warbringer, where in that book that is a YA kind of semi-origin story of like teenage Wonder Woman going on an adventure, and it was a very fun book, I quite enjoyed that one, has a whole part of one of the subplot of people using like resurrected Medusa and other kind of... Uh, mythological creature DNA to make new scientific monsters. Uh, So like halfway through this movie, I was like, wait a minute. Uh, (laughs) Where I don't remember the, now I got to figure out when Wonder Woman Warbringer was published. Just, I think they were kind of concurrent, but let me just check. Yeah. Using that Grecian history is always interesting because like the, the, once you have Shazam, you also like basically have to establish that that those that pantheon truly exists. Um, and then like you do the same thing <laughs> also like with a subtle light, wasn't it like at some point they're like vampires exist. Yeah. yeah she okay. just like casually drops the vampires exist. Like, As a side on. note, the, the reference of Wonder Woman saying, no vampires are real. And then moving on, like my brain was immediate. Like, where is my movie where Wonder Woman fights vampires? Cause I yeah. would 100% watch a movie where Wonder Woman's like, how do I fix man's world? Time to stake some vampires. <laughs> yeah. But the thing I was going to check is Wonder Woman Warbringer also came out in 2019. So like for whatever reason, this just idea of what if uh, what if modern scientists using ancient Greek DNA cells that are preserved through some sort of thing to make new monsters that Wonder Woman can and will fight uh was just in the air. It might have been something happening in comics around that time. Who knows? But it was just an interesting thing. Sometimes it's not even one thing inspires another. It's just, isn't it odd that these two things came into existence within a couple months of each other uh, when they were presumably both in production for years because that's how long it takes to make things. Uh, But still, very cool. But yeah, I think that's all of our comic history for this one for today. Mm -hmm. And with all that, let Zeta out of the watchtower.
Thank you for spending time with us here today. If you'd like to join us in discussing this incredible series, you can find us on Twitter at The YJ Files, on Facebook at Crashing the Mode, on Tumblr at TheYJFiles.tumblr.com, on our website, CrashingTheMode.com. And if that somehow is not enough for you, you can email us at whelmedpodcast at gmail.com. You can also find us on YouTube, Stitcher, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. And of course, if you'd like to support the show, please consider sharing it with a friend, enemy, we don't mind. Anybody at all, just share it with them Friend, and joining our ally. chats on social media. Yes. <laughs> Mechanical Medusa that you happen to know. Yeah. Uh, you can also support the show by giving us a five-star review and a rating on Apple Podcasts or your podcatcher of choice. The ratings, comments, and subscriptions help others find the show. If you do leave us a rating, please let us know, though, at our email address on oh, on at our email address or on social media, especially if you're outside the U.S., as those are much harder to find. If you are able to support us monetarily and wish to do so, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash crashing the mode. Even $1 a month can help us bring you even more awesome discussion sessions, interviews, reviews, and more. And remember, stay whelmed, everyone. You've been listening to Whelmed, the Young Justice Files podcast. Our hosts are Rich Howard and Emily Booza. Our editor and producer is Neil Powell. Our theme was composed by Emily Mio. Our logo was created by Kevin Bates. Whelmed is a fan-made podcast and is not officially affiliated with DC Comics, DC Entertainment, Warner Brothers Animation, and any other owners of Young Justice or its related source material. As such, these companies have sole ownership of all symbols, images, names, logos, and proprietary material related to Young Justice. Original content of this podcast is ours under Creative Commons. Thanks for listening, and stay whelmed.